Good morning, all. Good morning. Our greetings and announcements this beautiful day. Well, today, our uh, it's our hot providential. As the pastor likes to call it, hot potluck. But we'll have that in, in lieu of the um, adult Bible study. We'll have uh, just this devotional prayer we'll lead out this morning, just brief, as uh, we all get up to the trough and have our wonderful food in the loop and some wonderful fellowship. Tuesday will be the men's Bible study. Wednesday, as, as it has been, our Bible study on Zoom. Uh, Monday the 20th, Candy. Franklin. So we've got uh, food covered is at 5, and for those who can make it, please, at 3.30, all hands, uh, for 3.30 for the food covered on Monday. May, okay, our monthly uh, youth day. Is that has been postponed. It has. John and I have to be in the county. That's right. So. I knew that. Yeah. So, Just pass it on if you know somebody that's interested. And Saturday, October 2nd, we've talked about for a couple of weeks, we have our official invite come from the Eastbrook Church, so I'll just read it. It, says, it is the Contending for the Faith Conference. The topic was Jesus. The speaker, as we've said, is Travis Pelletier, campus pastor with Radio Christie. University of Maine, October the 2nd, 9.30 a.m. until 2 p.m. at the Eastbrook Community Building. On the left as you're going out through, beautiful inside, beautiful. And it's a killer lunch. You will not go away hungry, I can assure you. They do a magnificent job. And it is hosted by our brethren, Eastbrook Baptist Church. There's phone number and what have you, but it's, it's, a, it's a keeper. I'm sure you know, lunch is fabulous. Been there a couple times for them. And uh, what, what Samaritan's Purse, I think we have things that we passed out this morning. So with that, um, is Chris, where's Chris St. Louis? Kansas. Kansas. So he's not here to read the morning song, so I'll fill in for him this morning, if that's okay. Everyone, and this morning's psalm in the Bowden Bible is Psalm 19, verses 1 to 13. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, there are no words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them, he has sent a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom, leaving his chamber, and, like a strong man, runs its course with joy. It's rising from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there's nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true, and righteous altogether. More to be desired than any gold, even much fine gold, sweeter than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant from presumptuous Sins. Amen. Amen. 
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Beautiful, beautiful day out there. Um, I was thinking, listening to Mark read the Psalms, like you can't help it when you read scripture, the songs that just jump off the pages. When he was talking about it, it reminded me of the one of the verses of I'd rather have Jesus. Sweeter than honey from out of the comb. Um, I just want to share a little irony this morning. I was told it was political. I think it's just an observation. But yesterday there was a, a gathering at our nation's capital. And so our nation's capital was surrounded with wire and guarded by troops. Conversely, our border is wide open. So just thought that was kind of ironic. So we're going to, um, this is an addition to the songs in our bulletin. We're going to open by singing number 83. There's something about that name. Let's stand and sing together and then we'll... Oh, 
Heavenly Father, as we come into this place this morning, we ask that you, by your grace, be with us, minister to us, allow us to come before you, the living God, and worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, this morning we're only here because of Jesus Christ and his work upon the cross and all that he did for us to redeem us to yourself. Father, as we worship you this morning, we pray that you would speak to our hearts and minds, that you would grace us, that you would remind us, that you would lift us up, that you would exhort us. Father, be our God today. And again, we're only here by the presence of your Spirit because of the redemptive work of Jesus. And it was Jesus that taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. today in today's catechism is what is prayer? to take a bottle and fill it with your loose change. Um, $9 pays the shipping. I wrote postage, but it should have been shipping because it involves lots more than just postage. Um, the shipping for one shoe box. Last year we did 100 shoe boxes. Our goal is to do more than 100 this year. So that's what we're hoping for. These will be up back. We need 900 of those. 900? Just checking your math. A hundred would be right. A hundred so would be right. That would give right. us $900. Right, $900. Okay, gotcha. I didn't realize, Gary, but how many people? Well, <laughs> remember, I helped with a lot of the pieces. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, remember, I help with a lot of people's, um, in my other life, my, I do help with people. So I've been gathering for a while. Um, also, um, a note from Ann Clemmer a few days ago, and I just thought this was perfect. I didn't read this about the trombone, did I, already? No, no. no. okay, because I just had a weird moment. Okay, Ann Clemmer, who was in coma, I know. Uh, um, we were given a trombone that was found at a yard sale to bring back to Goma when we returned in July. It was in pretty bad shape, as it took up so much luggage space, one wondered if it was worth it. Today, from Today I learned from Dr. Joe that it is the best and has an incredible sound. They cleaned it up, oiled it. The sound is tremendous. He says it's the best one. I think there is a lesson in that. Cast aside, neglected, but highly valuable when one takes the time to care for it. We never know the pot potential on the inside. And I'm gonna play you what she put with it. We're going to get it so I can show you video too, but just don't have that yet. And this is in their worship service. So God is good all the time. Amen. Thank you. Whoops. Nope, not again. No, they got it. I could definitely hear that trombone. My mother used to play the trombone, so it brought back some memories. Uh, this time, if our ushers will come forward to receive our morning offering.
read this morning from Mark. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. Teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. calling the crowd to 
him with his disciples. He said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Gary. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Um, today, uh, we're praying for this week, I should say, not today. We're praying for the Ellsworth United Baptist Church. And uh, just remember in the association, they are doing so much down here. And I appreciate our ties with them. And we need to hold them up if they would keep going and moving in the direction that they are. Uh, God has blessed them, and they're trying to be faithful in their witness because they're sitting in downtown Ellsworth. Um, it's, it's not like sitting here on this corner in Clifton. We're country folks compared to, and, and Ellsworth's a small city, a small town, but yet there's so much going on here. So we need to, to pray for them, their uh, other programs, and their counseling programs, and their medical program, and cohort program and developing young pastors. So um, there's so much that I ask that you would remember them this week. I'd ask that it, for us that you pray for our little church, that people would really desire and have an interest to be in the Word, that each one of you would want to be more. Um, I like to pick on the elders from time to time. Um, it's a lot of fun for me and keeps them on their toes, but they they do reciprocate. But one of the things that I want to point out is we have a desire for the Word. The reason why we should have a desire for the Word, and the reason I mentioned the elders, one of my elders missed out this morning on our psalm. Because of the amount of the psalm, it had to go over to the next page. Oh. So we lost a verse and a half. But I only want to give you the last verse. It's the 14th verse of Psalm 19, which says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. That should be what we think about as we read God's word. How do we apply it to our lives? How do I think about it? How do I let it be a part of my heart and engross me? And I think sometimes we get so caught up, and you know it's my favorite saying, in the barrenness of busyness. That life just seems to spin by. And before you know, we've lost some moments with the Lord. I thought of the title of a movie that was out years ago um, this week. Stop the world, I want to get off. Because the world's spinning so fast and there's so much going on. And if we just would step back, and we, we saw it this morning, not only in the reading of the Psalms, but you know, in what Gary just read us in our response of reading, Jesus has points to make to us that we need to apply in our lives today, and we need to get a hold of those. So in our prayer time this morning, I'd ask that maybe you would pray, maybe you would pray as God leads you, that you would have a greater desire for His Word, that it would burn in your heart, that you would meditate on it day and night, and may that meditation enrich your life and let the busyness of the world fade away so it doesn't distract. Because the toughest thing in this life is the distractions that keep us from focusing on God, and especially Christ Jesus our Savior. So as we go to prayer this morning and as the folks lead us in prayer, think on these things if you would, and I'll close. Let's pray.
thank you for our many, many, many blessings. But Lord, I also thank you for the struggles. I know that it's through the struggles that sometimes we grow even closer to you. So Lord, please help keep my heart on the things you would have me thinking about and doing. And Lord, be with us in our coming days. Lord, I ask that you take our nation and you cradle her in your hands in these next weeks and months. Lord, you come to our forefathers and they sought your face as you covenanted with Israel. I pray, Lord, that you will not let America slip into nothing, just that, that she will restore, be restored, and that what you have for America will indeed come to pass. Lord, we don't deserve this. But you are, you are full of mercy, and you will continue to be merciful. So we seek your face, Lord, that you will do what you want in this nation, and that your word will go out in a strong and new way, and the Holy Spirit will lead people back to you, and that your word will go out, Lord, and we will indeed have your heart. We thank you, Lord, for what you are doing, for your name is great. Heavenly Father, we come here this morning to worship you. To worship you in spirit and in truth. Because we believe not only are you there, but you're not silent. Not only are you there, but you care about each and every one of us. And you know what goes on in our lives. Father, we've already read in our catechism this morning that prayer is pouring our heart hearts to you in praise. So we praise you for being our God. We praise you that we have you to go to. That there's no way that all of our lives have happened by chance, but you direct, as your word says, the courses of our life. Father, we praise you because you are a God of wisdom, a God of knowledge, a God of might and of God of execution. You bring things to pass. You bring your will to pass. Father, this morning we pray and prayers have already gone up that you would be with us, that you would lead us, that you would give us revival. And we know that true revival will never start until it starts in each one of us individually. Father, revive us again. You are our God. But we want to be a confessing people, reminding ourselves that we don't always walk as you would want us to walk. We always don't talk as you would want us to talk. We don't love as you want us to love. We're not obedient as you want us to obey. So, Father, forgive us our sins. Forgive each and every one of us. Forgive the sins of this preacher as we come to you this morning and worship you, the living God. Father, we need to thank you for, again, not just being there, but being involved. Not only do you tell us you love us, you show us you love us. What a wonderful God you are. But we know that you're just and what we deserve, and rightfully so, you give us. Whether it be from a hard hand or from a loving approach, you remind us that we belong to you. 
So Father, this morning as we come to you as the church, we lift you up. We worship you through your Son, Jesus Christ, by the power of your Holy Spirit, and that none of our own. Father, this morning, bless us as we continue to worship. Be our God. We ask these things humbly in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Things. Um, I ask for prayers for my sister, my oldest sister, and her husband, um, Becky and Bruce. He's the pastor at the Groton Baptist Church in Groton, Connecticut. And last Friday, he was diagnosed with COVID. They both are vaccinated. And then Monday, she was also diagnosed with COVID. They, I spoke with her yesterday, actually by text. But, um, seems to be the preferred way of communicating these days. Um, she, they're both doing pretty well. And she made the comment, she says, we seem to get off, her husband Bruce is getting his taste back, but they seem to get awful tired from not doing much. And I said, sounds more like old age, but. Um, so anyway, so I'd ask for prayers for them. It's Becky and Bruce Peterson. How many knew the song that um, was played during the offertory today? It was, I Asked the Lord. Oh, what a beautiful, beautiful song. I haven't heard that for a long time. Oh, what a message. What a message that song has. You know, it says, I asked the Lord to comfort me when things weren't going my way. He said to me, I will comfort you and lift your cares away. I asked the Lord to walk with me when darkness was all that I knew. He said to me, never be afraid, for I will see you through. I didn't ask for riches, he gave me wealth untold, the moon, the stars, the sun, the sky, and gave me eyes to behold. Mm -hmm. I thank the Lord for everything, and I, I count my blessings each day. Mm -hmm. He came to me when I needed him, I only had to pray, and he'll come to you if you ask him to, he's only a prayer away. What a song. Um, let's turn our hymnals to number 442. Stand as we sing. I'm not familiar with this, so if you don't know, we'll all learn it together. And, uh... This is new to everybody. It's new to everybody. Well, Bob it. knows it. So let's stand in. Are we going to sing it twice then? Should we? Well, let's go. I'll, 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 I'll play the first part. Play the first part so you can hear it. We'll play all together. Okay, so we're going to play the first part of the song so you can hear it, and then we'll go back and sing the whole song through. It's a beautiful song. Dude. Each one. 
church um, had a little agreement that uh, if I knew that, I was going to lead it instead of him leading it. And I said, sure, no problem. I, and I asked him to do something, and he did what he was supposed to do, but I didn't know the song. So I wasn't leading it. So he said, I knew you were going to renege on that. But anyways, before we get started this morning, we're starting a new book. Now, for some of you, this is going to be a little tough because it's in the Old Testament. I know you've got to go look for those books in the Old Testament. But we're going to start with Jonah today. But to give you an idea about Jonah, and it, probably a little bit you didn't know. Hopefully you knew all of it. Um, I've, I've asked Gary. Gary's going to play a little video that we're going to throw up on the screen to get you set for going into Jonah. It's a little song. I'm not going to ask you to sing it. It's not like Dave, but it's the background for Jonah. So, anyways, Gary, whenever you're ready. Let's meet Jonah who told people what God wanted him to say. God told Jonah to go to Nineveh, but he went the other way. Jonah got on a boat and sailed into the sea. God sent a big storm while Jonah was sleeping. Why would this be? Then Jonah said, The storm is because of me. The sails threw Jonah over the side of the boat. The storm stopped at once and the ship was kept afloat. Jonah was swallowed by a great big fish. He was in his belly going swish, swish, swish. The fish swam along for three days and nights. Jonah said he was sorry and that he would make it right. So God ordered the fish to spit Jonah out. And Jonah told the people what God was all about When the people of Nineveh heard what he had to say They stopped doing bad things and changed their wicked ways God saved the people of Nineveh from a really bad fate Jonah learned to obey God and what it was like to be fish bait. Now let's pray and go home. Yeah. <laughs> we know all about Jonah. Actually, I, I was thinking as we put this together as I was working, working on my sermon about the little girl in school, and you probably heard me tell this story before. And the teacher and her got into a little discussion because the little girl said on Sunday she had learned about Jonah and the whale. And she didn't say whale, she said fish, and the teacher said it had to be a whale because there isn't a fish big enough to swallow a person. And, you know. and then she got into the discussion that it couldn't have been a whale because there's something small in the throat and it couldn't pass in and it doesn't work. And the little girl said, well, you know what? I believe it was a fish. And when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask Jonah to tell me exactly, is it a fish? And the teacher, having her way with the little child, says, what if Jonah didn't go to heaven and he went somewhere else? And the little girl looked at the teacher and said, then you ask him. <laughs> This morning, we're only going to look at the first, actually four verses. I was going to go into six, but I want to get into the first four. Jonah is more than just a fish story. Jonah is more 
God's purpose for us to look at it is more than just somebody who was disobedient. God always gives us His Word so that we can look at ourselves and judge ourselves according to the plumb line of His Word. And we'll be in Jonah for a little while, even though it's only four chapters. But let's look at the first four verses of Jonah. Uh, if you're looking for it, it's right after Obadiah, which I preached on Obadiah, and it's just before Micah. Not for Micah, but Micah. Okay? Jonah in the Old Testament. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amati, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from that presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Verse 4. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Let's speak to the Father, if we may, for a moment. Heavenly Father, we know that your word has a purpose for us in our lives. We pray that by your grace and mercy that you would illustrate in us what you want us to see and live out. How you want us to apply your word, to interpret it correctly. Father, we can only do this by your spirit. We are frail and we fall far short of doing it correctly on our own. It's by the presence of your Holy Spirit here that guides us and teaches us. And we pray this morning that you would guide us, help us, Father, as we look at this prophet of yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Jonah was an actual person. And I say that because many people believe there are people in the world today that believe that there's a lot of the Bible that's just conjecture, nice stories, maybe like a, a parable. You know what a parable is? It's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Maybe it's something like that. Jesus quotes the fact that in Matthew 12, they wanted a sign. He says, you'll only get the sign of Jonah. And he talks about his death. Jonah's mentioned he was a prophet, and what makes it really stand out is in 2 Kings 14, he prophesied about Jeroboam. In fact, that the land would increase. And he was a wonderfully loved prophet then, because of his prophecy about Jeroboam II involved the expansion of the kingdom. His message certainly made him popular, but when God called Jonah to preach to the city of Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrian Empire, the prophet rebelled. It was just a little bit more than Jonah wanted to deal with. Uh, how many of you have ever said something when you were given a job or you worked for somebody or uh, whatever you were doing, and all of a sudden, you realize the task is a little harder ahead of you than you want, and you go, I didn't sign up for this. And that was his problem. And one of the reasons, it, it, I, I, you know, I gotta think here, Jonah, I, I feel for Jonah. I'll explain to you why. If you look at history, the Assyrians, history tells us that they were cruel and heartless people who thought nothing. Now the children are children. Okay, they're, Frankie's gone with that. They thought nothing of burying their enemies alive. Skinning them alive, or impaling them on sharp poles under the hot sun. Nice people. They followed all of the Geneva Conventions. 
You know, they, they were like, they captured somebody, we'll, we'll take care of them, we'll be nice to them, we'll treat them, you can get your Red Cross package on the 30th of the month, that kind of stuff. They weren't those kind of people. They were awful, awful, awful people when it came to war. And if the city of Nineveh is going to be overthrown, Joan is probably thinking, let it be overthrown. If they're going to face punishment, they deserve punishment. Do you ever hear of somebody that's going to get their due and you go, well, they deserve it. Let them get it. I'd rather just not even deal with it and we don't want to remember them anymore. Jonah probably, and this is speculation, but think about this. He probably said, I would rather disobey God than see my enemies saved from judgment. Some of us may even think that today. As we look at the world around us and the things that are going on. So in the four chapters of this book, Jonah traces his own experiences and the lessons that he learned. And my prayer is that we learn some application for our lives today in 2021. So the three points I want to look at this morning, and the first one is losing our footing. Because that's exactly what, what Jonah did here. He, he was losing his footing. You ever get on a wet floor and all of a sudden you're starting to slip and you're looking for something to grab hold of and you don't know what to grab hold of and by the way, we should be praying for uh, Marsha. Marsha took a bad fall this week. She fell off the edge of a chair and bruised herself really, really bad. They're not here today, not so much because of that. They're traveling with family. But uh, she took a bad fall. I hate the thought of a fall as we become older and seniors. One of the biggest dangers for seniors is fall. It's well documented. Yesterday I took a fall. I'm fine. It was, there's a rug. I hate rugs. I hate hook carpet rugs. I hate all kinds. Of, did I say that? No, I'm sorry. So. I, rugs, they trip you up and you fall. When you lose your footing, you fall. And when I read these, the scripture of going back over, preparing for this sermon, I'm thinking, Man, Jonah, you're losing your footing. You lost your footing. He's falling. Sometimes in our walk as disciples of the Lord, we find it hard to accept what God our Father wants us to do. And we get slippery feet. Sometimes we even start to feel like Asaph. I was thinking about Asaph. He wrote the 73rd Psalm. He wrote in the 73rd Psalm, but as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. And why did he write that? Because he was looking at the world and how prosperous the world was. He said, man, they're doing okay. The bad guys are doing okay. The fat cats are doing all right. They don't think there's a God. They don't believe there's a God. What's the point of all this? I'm trying to do, and we read it this morning, didn't we? We read it in the response, of, not the response of reading, we read it in the Psalms, that the precepts of the Lord are correct, that we will be rewarded if we hold them, and he was forgetting that. The laws of the Lord are perfect. They're, they're sweeter than honey, much more than the, the honeycomb. And when we forget how God's word helps our lives, we start to lose our footing. And Asaph says, I started to lose my footing and I nearly lost my foothold. As we were going through Ephesians, that's why Paul said, stand. Stand firm. And when you've done everything to stand, stand. Yesterday, Deb and I got the opportunity, a rare one for me this year, um, but to go watch my grandson play football. They got walked. <laughs> they should have just got on the, off the bus and turned around and back on the bus and just left. Just said, let's call it a day, you know? But, but watching some of those men, those young men, 
Fight in the trenches. Catching a foothold is important. Being dug in is important. And if we're not dug into God's Word, if you don't know God's Word, how do you talk to somebody about God's Word? Remember, I've said it many, many times. You can't take somebody to a place you've never been. And if somebody comes up and wants to discuss, that's why this apologetics one day thing here at the Eastbrook Community Center is important for people. Because it's going to focus on how do you tell somebody about Jesus Christ? How do you tell something at all to somebody about God if you're not steeped in His Word? Jonah was told to go tell them what I'm going to tell you to tell them. He knew, and yet he was warm. I don't know. Asaph said, you know what? Asaph said, I almost lost my footing, but when I got it back is when I went into the temple. When he came back to church, when he got back into the Word, when he brought himself to the fellowship of the saints, when he brought himself around those that we should be, <laughs> that's why Baptists eat so much. Uh, and we, we don't do it as much as we used to. Dick used to say, boy, this is the most eating his church I've been in. <laughs> We used to do it, but there's something about sitting and breaking bread with people. And that's part of our fellowship. When you're fellowshipping with the saints, and when you're breaking bread with them, that doesn't mean just eating physically. Breaking bread is the bread of life. In God's Word, sitting and studying and, and, and talking together. We used to have, I was part of a group of pastors, and we would meet theologically once or twice a month. At, at our high point, it was twice a month, we would meet down in Le Moyne. And uh, there was a group of us, I think there was six all together, and we would take a passage of scripture and we'd kick it around. We'd talk about it. Talk from our background, from our schooling, from our studies, from everything, but we'd work on the Word of God. I missed it because some of the pastors left and some retired. And it's starting back up. And you know what? I, I almost, I'm salivating thinking about the day when we start back up and I can go sit with these pastors, these brothers of the Lord, and most of it's a new group. It makes a difference. It helps my footing so that I won't lose my footing. But the problem with Jonah here is he's like Asaph. He's thinking they're not working. He's looking at the world instead of God's Word. He's looking at the outside. He's not thinking about who's sending him. He's thinking about the ones he's going to. He's lost, actually, in this case. He's lost the footing that he had. He's not just losing it. He might have thought that he had served God and now his work is done. Some people are like that. Okay, Lord, I, I showed up to church on Sunday. I put some money in the plate. I sang the songs I know, even the one I didn't know they taught us today. Lord, I, I did that. I showed up, and, and I'm okay. I, I even brought a dish uh, for the pot providential meal. I did all. You like that? I got that in there. Um, I, I did that. I've done my duty. That's all I, I've done. And there are people that think, there are pastors who think that they shouldn't tithe. Because they said, I've done my duty, I'm the preacher. That's, that's ludicrous to me. To me, that's ludicrous. The same requirements on you are the same as on me as a pastor. i got to come and get into the Word. I, I, I can't just sit back all week and, and, and rely on what I learned in school. I've got to stay in the Word. I've got to not just prepare for preaching, but I've got to, it means something to my heart. It means something to my mind. I need it so that my footing, my footing is firm. But some think that they paid their fire insurance is all is well with me and God. And anything beyond what we're doing right here on Sunday morning is, is, is okay. That's not right. That's wrong. In fact, so wrong. This is what some people think church is. 
This is their God. This is their God in their lives. And, and when it gets close to 9 o'clock on Sunday morning, Oh God, you're here! It's 9 o'clock! Oh, I'm so glad you're here, God. I can worship now. Oh, the next hour. Wow. Thank you, God, for being here. Oh, the fat guy's late this morning. It's 10.30. Oh, i got to get home to that roast. Or I don't know what I'm doing after I get out of here, but I'm going to do something else. God, it's 10.30. We've got to be done. 10.35. Oh, 10.35. I'll see you next Sunday. And off home we go. Think about that. Don't give me too much. I got control. Jonah. Jonah had God in a box. Go tell Nineveh. Shit, I got this. I'm going to Tarshish. By the way, it's Tarshish. Not Saul from Tarsus. Different town. Tarsus. And by the way, if you look at it, no one knows where Tarsus is today. It was either on the north of Africa or it was the bottom of Spain. I go with Africa for a reason. Because the ships, the Bible mentions Tarsus many times. So it wasn't a, a, an obscure, this is a one-time deal we hear about this one place that he gets on a boat Jones is going to. No. There's many references in the Bible, in Isaiah, in Ezekiel. They had, they would bring ships of gold, ivory, apes, peacocks on the ships from Tarshish. So, I think of peacocks, there are peacocks in Africa. Everybody thinks they come from India. But there is a strange, and apes, Africa, you know, ivory, Africa. So maybe they're on the north shore of Africa. They went up to Carthage or whatever. Not important, but Tarshish was a real place. We just don't know where it is today. And this is where he wants to go. He thinks he's got God in the box. I can go and I can leave. Tim Keller says in quoting Flannery O'Connor, the way to avoid, and for us today, the responsibilities of God, but the way to avoid Jesus was to avoid sin. See, we think if we go to church, we're not sinning and we're sitting there and if we put the right amount in the offering, we're doing the right thing, we're not sinning. We think that if we are religiously observant, virtuous, and good, then we paid our dues, as it were. Now, God can't just ask anything of us. Look, I've done, Lord, everything you want me to, and here we are. You're in the box. And there's nothing you can ask me because I've done what I'm supposed to do. So now we start to get that thinking sometimes in our faith that he owes us. There are people in the church that think God owes us something. Look at Jonah's attitude here. It's almost like he thinks God is obligated to answer his prayers. Even though he doesn't even pray to him. Some people today think that, well, Lord, thank you. Uh, I'm glad that you're here. Um, I don't know what I'm asking you because I'm battling, so I don't know what's going on. But, but whatever my needs are, would you meet my needs? Thank you, amen, goodbye. Debbie and I have a show that I like. I think Herb got me on it years ago in the series. And, but we're watching the newest one. It's still open all hours. And, and it's about a fellow at Granville who runs a little grocery store in England. But every night he comes out as he's cleaning up the front of his store and he has this conversation with the grocery god. But it's God. If, if he didn't say once in a while to the grocery god, you'd think he was talking to God. But he's just battling on what he wants. It's like God is Santa Claus. And we're telling him what we want on the 25th. We start to put demands on God, and God should do these things for us because He's God. 
Yeah, I believe in God, and He is God, and He is great, and He is magnificent. That's why He should do these things for me. Now, Jonah is already prophesied. He is a prophet of God. What is he thinking? By the way, when we have those kind of attitudes, we're not moving towards Him, God, in grateful joy, glad surrender, and love. But, still, instead, we are um, trying to control God. Keep him at arm's length. Keep him in the jack-in-the-box. Keep him to where I don't have to deal with him only but when I want to deal with him or when I need him. When the rent's due. Or when some other kind of catastrophe. Somebody sitting in the emergency room at 2 o'clock in the morning. I laughed and you probably heard me say, I, I knew a sheriff used to say, if you want to meet Jesus, come with me to the jail on Friday and Saturday nights. Because there's a lot of people crying out to Jesus in the jail because they got caught. But it is your faith in God and in Christ when you're not in jail, when you're not in trouble, when you're going through the good times? Or is it only in the bad times? See, Jonah's problem is he thinks he is controlling God. Look at verse 3. He says, so he paid the fear and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Well, listen, loved ones. Listen, church. Think about that. If, you, if you're good Bible students and you understand God's Word and you understand it clearly, what's wrong with that thinking? Where are you going to go where God's not going to see you? Paul Harden would say, this is the rest of the story. Psalms 139, 7. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? Verse 8. If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in show, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, verse 9. In verse 10, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. Where can you go that God doesn't know that you're there? The second point this morning that I'd like to bring up is not only losing your footing, but now that you've lost your footing, and Jonah did, the slide. Remember that when we were kids, and they think you still have them around. You hook up a hose to that long plastic sprinkler thing, and it was called a slip and slide. You get it on enough of an incline there, and the water's running, and you run it and jump on the plastic and take the slide and just go. Some of the best ball players I've ever seen was somebody who could slide into second base and not get tagged. The slide. When we stop seeing the need of those who are living in anguish, when we stop seeing the need of the lost in the world, those who are not saved, the need of those who are living in despair, those without hope and without Christ, kind of like Asaph, we feel like we're better off. Jonah was. If Nineveh was condemned, so will be it. We've lost the commandment that Christ gave us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. He said, making disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded, and baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And the problem for you and I is, and, and over the years you've heard me quote this many, many times, Ezekiel 38, uh, 33, 8, 9. If I say to the wicked, O wicked one, you shall surely die, and you do not speak, to warn the wicked to turn from his way, that wicked person shall die in his iniquity or his sin. But his blood I will require at your hand. God is saying, I'm going to ask you what you did wrong. Why did you act the Jonah? 
Why did you not tell them? That's tantamount to being probably the best surgeon in the world and, and going into a, an operating room where, they, where they're trying to fight to save someone's life and you, you could just put your hand in there and cut and do whatever you have to do, but you look and you go, good luck, and you walk out of the room. Then in verse 9, though, he says, the Lord, but if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, that person shall die in his sin, but you will have delivered yourself, your soul, it says in the, in our, the uh, ESV. We have a responsibility. Jonah had a responsibility to go tell these people that, listen, Smarten up. One of my favorite songs of Nat King Cole was Straighten Up and Fly Right. <laughs> God's going to hold you responsible. It's not part of the song, but that's my point. God's going to hold us responsible. In fact, in verse 3, though Jonah apparently understood and appreciated God's wrath against Assyria, he was not nearly so compassionate as God was. All right, Lord. I know. I know they've been kind of... I, I, yeah, Lord, I've heard. Now you didn't even have a conversation with the Lord. He's not praying. He's not saying, Lord, I know. He just... I'm gone. Nineveh? Nineveh? Billy Graham used to preach that... <laughs> God's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah if he doesn't hold 42nd Street and New York City Times Square responsible for the sins there. Imagine. And here's Jonah's attitude. Well, so be it. Wait a minute. God, God's got a plan. You're his prophet. He's told you, and, and loved ones, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, if you're trusting in Him this morning, if you know the Lord, you have an obligation that when you go out through these doors, that sign means something up there. We're going to the mission field. We've got to tell other people. Motivated by patriotic duty, I think. Because Israel was not going to put up with stuff like the Assyrians. It clouded maybe Jonah's religious obligation. And knowing God's forgiving mercy, Jonah just shirked his responsibility. And sometimes we do that. They're not worth it. I'll quote somebody who I happen to love very dearly. Who says, just nuke them all and let the Lord sort it up. I shouldn't laugh. That's not really what God wants. God wants us to bring the word to him. Jonah shirked. Jonah backed off. Jonah ran from his responsibility. It is strange that a prophet of God would not follow God's command to preach condemnation. Isn't it? Think about that. You'd think the guy would want to go and say, listen, buddy, <laughs> you're doomed. You're doomed. Your days are numbered. There is a chance. If you smarten up and fly right, straight up and fly right, there is a chance. But that chance is on you. So are you going to listen to the words? Are you going to listen to the message? There's a lot of political background to this that I'm not going to get into. Um, it does, Nineveh does straighten out. We'll get to that. Um, it, it lasts 100 to 150 years. They Things worked out. But, God's condemned them. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, where's your care for those people? We don't know who's going to respond to the message. We don't know how. They're. That's between them and God. Our job is to take the word to them. To tell them the old, old story of Jesus and his love. This morning, Who have you? Who have you neglected telling about the love of Christ? Is 
there somebody in your life? Somebody that you rub elbows with? Maybe it's a family member. But who? I have a family member that went into a tirade on Facebook, and I don't get on Facebook, and I looked at it, and I go, the things you're complaining about are the same things you do. The young people today don't want to listen to the other side. Not just young people, older people too. There's no discussion. There's no reasoning in the world anymore. But it doesn't matter. Our responsibility is to stay faithful. So again, my question, church, to you this morning is, who have you neglected telling about the love of Christ? See, with Jonah, at first he had the wrong attitude towards God's will. He thought it was something difficult and dangerous. And listen, ah, Nineveh? You want me to go to Nineveh? I told Debbie one time, you know, we think we're here until we retire. And that's what we pray the Lord does. The Lord, you hear me in front of witnesses. But if the Lord called us, say, to New York City tomorrow and made it evidently clear, I'm going to be going to pray somewhere. I'm, I'm throwing up some prayers to heaven. I'm going, Lord, really? New York City or Chicago or Miami? or I heard probably was thinking Los Angeles because it's further away. But wherever, wherever, I'm, I'm throwing up the prayers. So, he said Nineveh, and he, he, he overlooks. God's never going to ask you to do something that he does not equip you for. If you want to write something down, just want to write that down. He does not ask you to do anything he will not equip you for. He doesn't send you out there with an empty gun. We saw him in the last few weeks in Ephesians. He gives you a full armor to wear. He prepares you for battle. So he's not going to end. And Jonah missed this whole thing. And he had the wrong attitude toward witnessing. He thought he could turn his witnessing on and off. I don't have to tell them right now. I can turn this on and off when I want to. And he did not realize that he was witnessing either against or for the Lord no matter where he was. So, guess what? In that boat, we'll get into this later on as we go into the book. He's sitting there and they're going, Hey, buddy, wake up. You should be praying to your God. He wasn't. He was, I don't know how you sleep in a boat this morning, but I'm not a mariner, I'm not a sailor. I don't know how you do that. And then on top of all this, he lost his testimony with the men on the ship because he was sleeping. The heathens were praying, praying to their gods. But Jonah, he's asleep. And they're thinking, what kind of God did you have? do you have that you're sleeping? Man, if you've got a God and he is a God, then you should be praying. So he lost his testimony with the men on the ship. And he lost his influence, by the way, with, for good. And I don't know if you've ever had this situation, but if you've ever had the chance to witness to somebody, and a conversation comes up, it could have been at work, it could have been in the family, it could have been anywhere, and all of a sudden you had the chance, and you open your mouth later, and some people look at you and say, why didn't you say that when we were discussing this over here? Does it mean anything to you? Does your God mean something? You had an opportunity to share this Christ you want to talk about, but you didn't. So why bring him up now? And that, you know, these sailors are kind of looking at that going, buddy, what are you all about? You can't have much of a God. He also came very close to losing his life. But when they found out that he was the cause of the storm, but how patient and long-suffering uh, long the Lord is. God is slow to anger, the Bible tells us. And he was very slow to anger with him, with Jonah. When sin enters our life, it has ways of bringing on 
consequences that are not favorably welcomed. Think about that. When we do some of the things that Jonah's done here, when we neglect our responsibility, when we neglect our Bible study, when we neglect our prayer time, when we neglect our worship, when we neglect being in the fellowship of the saints, when we neglect the things that are part of the body of Christ, sin has a chance to creep in your door. I think of in Genesis. When Cain killed Abel, remember Cain was told, sin is crouching at your door and its desire is to overtake you. And the consequences here on Jonah is now he's in the rough. And he, and he can't change it. It isn't going to happen. A Bible theologian, one left child says, leap child says, no instance of backsliding can be more aggravated than the one of the Apostle Peter. He denied Christ three times that night. And yet no recovery was more seen as Peter became one of the leaders with James of the church in Jerusalem. Became such a witness as a missionary before Paul. While what stands in the record for those who have failed, no traitor to his Lord and Master is justified in saying, well, the door of hope is closed against my return. I failed. But our, in Revelation, we're told that Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. And he's talking to the church. And he says, if any man will open the door, I will come in and sup with him, fellowship with him, and he with me. So if we failed, if we dropped the ball, if we missed the point, we need to think of those who have, who have gone on before us. Characters like David. Characters like so many that we see in the Old Testament and New Testament. But God is a God of restoration and God can work with us and lift us up. We see David in the Old Testament as a, as a prime example. We see Peter in the New Testament. While both illustrate the shame and sorrow of a backsliding state, they stand forth as monuments of the sovereign grace which can forgive the penitent wanderer. And once more give into our hearts the peace that passes all understanding in Philippians 4 7. Another Bible commentator I like, Derek Kidner, writes Sin sets up strains. Sin sets up strains in the structure of life which can only end in breakdown. The strain from sin ends up breaking us down, and bad things are happening, is what he's saying. Generally speaking, liars are lied to, attackers are attacked, and he who lives by the sword dies by the sword. God created us to live for him more than for anything else. Jonah slipped and forgot that. This morning, are you running away from the things of the Lord? Has the Lord given you something on your plate you should be doing that you're not? That you're allowing it to go by? You're not giving it the attention you're supposed to? You're not telling somebody you're supposed to? And here's the hard question as we go to prayer. Are there storms in your life that indicate such? Is something going on in your life that's showing you that you've missed the stagecoach to Nineveh, but you're on the boat to Tarshish. Let's pray. Father, we again thank you for your word. We thank you for those that you have given us. So Father, forgive me, but to smarten us up, to make us think, to make us pour our hearts out before you. Father, bless us now as we think on these things. 
In Jesus' name. Turn our hymnals this morning as we close our service to number 444. I love to tell the story. We'll sing verses 1, 3, and 4. Let's stand and sing together. 444.